everything worthwhile is hard to do. The natural state of human beings, our default condition, is to want as much benefit with as little effort as possible. We're basically lazy people. If you feel deep in your heart that making money is taking money away from other people, that every dollar you get paid is something that another person has less of, then you are going to be considerably less effective at what you do. Hmm. But envy is, is horrible. It's the worst of everything because it means that I'm envious of you. It's not that I want to get things you got. So I don't want you to have them. The difference between greed and ambition is greed is it's all about me. An ambitious person uh, is trying to add to the sum total of the society around him. Our ambition should be limitless. Our greed should be zero. Never short stopping. Now I'm winning like I'm Jida. Steady through the rigor. So my guest today is Rabbi Daniel Lappin coming back for round two of our conversation. One of the greatest interviews we did early in this year, but ancient wisdom that can help you with your finances potential for some of you have aspirations for it to be a first generation cash flow faith based millionaire. And Daniel Lappin is a South African born American Orthodox rabbi, author and public speaker. We actually just talked before we started recording this interview about a a course that he teaches to as well. I'm very intrigued about that. But Rabbi Lapin was previously the founding rabbi of the Pacific Jewish Center in Venice, California, and the former head of the Toward Tradition, the Commonwealth Loan Company, and the Cascadia Business Institute. Now here in the United States of America, Rabbi Lapin, welcome back to the Seven Figure Squad. Great to be back with you. You know, I can't tell you how many people, like a lot of people, contacted me after the last interview who saw it and uh, loved, loved our conversation. But every single one of them spoke about how you had changed their financial lives. Oh, wow. Well, amen. So, you know, that's, uh, well, that's what the channel is hopefully getting across is that uh, there's a, uh, uh, such a biblical and, and uh, spiritual connection to what we're doing. It's just not money, it's just not dollars, it's just not promotions, it's just not recognition. There's a, a, a faith-based belief of, of how you go about making money. So. Uh, Rabbi, I've got some follow-up questions from our last interview. Um, I, I want to go on this since you're you're very comfortable on the socio-economic, political type conversation of things. You know, we've been in this pandemic now for going on two years, and uh, I, I think the first interview we did, you were just recovering from COVID. Uh, <laughs> you're right, and I I took the prohibited medications. <laughs> Not the jab, jab, right? Just, uh, exactly. Um, and now we, we're in the era of the um, the Omicron variant. It seems like there's always going to be this thing. So uh, uh, you're part of the media. You, you you've been uh, of, of part of the news. You've been interviewed many different places. Uh, what is going on? What is your take of the exhaustion that everybody in America across the world is really feeling about this pandemic and and the shutdowns and the mandates and the vaccine requirements that are being and I mean, here in america we're hearing things of going on things going on in in australia and france and europe are actually straight down just locking people down and restricting people's freedoms what's your take on what's going on right now um so uh matt i'll tell you but i'll i'll issue a little warning at first which is sure. that um that you may um you may find some of my views objectionable and uh, downright subversive. So you just cut me off whenever you like. But, yeah, but, sure. but here, here, I mean, here's the first principle. The first principle is that uh, the good Lord created us with certain desires and urges. Um, so for instance, the natural state of human beings, our default condition is to want as much benefit with as little effort as possible. We're basically lazy people. It's one of the reasons that incentivization compensation packages work really well. Yes, sure, sure. Because going to work on Monday is, is not easy, not for anybody. Yes. And so if there's incentive, I'm more likely. It's because that's one of the ways God created us. Another way God created us um, is to... Um, uh, as, as certainly as men, to seek as many women as possible. And, um, and it's, it, it usually takes a long time for a guy to discover that what he really needs is one woman. I, I've, n I've never personally experienced that, Rabbi Lepin. I've been a Christian my entire life. And I've never been divorced. No, just kidding. 
<laughs> I, I completely understand what you're going through. Every every young man out there goes through it. I mean, uh, I've got uh, yeah. boys. I've got uh, three boys, and we have this conversation. So um, another thing is we don't like exercise, but we do like eating. For sure. You know, these, uh, these indulgences. And so um, a wise person who wants to, to live a successful life um, learns what these urges are, learns how to regulate them and how to control them. And that way you get the, the maximum enjoyment of life with at the same time um, avoiding the self-destructive tendencies that we all have built into us if we act with no restraint whatsoever. Well, here is one that is less known. The ones I've been talking about, you know, we all nod our heads and say, hey, I, I know what you're talking yeah. about. But here's one not everybody recognizes. I bet you do not have this because you've got a strong military background. And, and I think I think um, uh, I think a military experience tends to cure people of this one. But let me tell it to you anyway. Sure. Uh, we we have a horrible tendency to really enjoy controlling other people and exerting power over other people. Wow. Wow. Manip manipulation. It's, yeah, right. I guess. Yeah. And, you know, if you haven't, if you've ever had a miserable um, clerk attend to you in a post office, the United States post, Postal Service office, you know what I'm talking about. The power like trip. They, it's the power they trip. hate their job. They go on a little power trip. Um, and I mean, I, I had it just a few weeks ago. Stand back, sir. Stand back behind that line. Mm -hmm. You know, fine. Mm -hmm. So I'll move six inches, but if it'll make you feel better, you know. Yeah. Uh, but this tendency of human beings to enjoy exerting power over others is a very real thing. It's there. Wow. Uh, many of us get to control it and understand it. If you've been in a in a situation where you've been taught discipline, like like in a military service situation, mm -hmm. then you probably tend to get over it and you say, you know what, I'm 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 good with let live and let live. I don't have to control anybody, but. But people do uh, enjoy that control aspect. And we've got to understand that uh, people who have a tendency in that direction like going into politics because it's the best way to get to controlling other people. And, uh, and that being the case, uh, COVID was an absolute godsend. It was, it was, like, it was like, you know, tell 12 ounces of cocaine for an addict. It was, sure. it's, just, it's just beautiful. All yeah. of a sudden, I can tell people how to live their lives in every small and every last detail. Because they're living in fear. Yeah. Because you're able, you're able to create an atmosphere of fear. And I'll, I'll tell you a general rule, Matt. A general rule is that uh, I'm doing it for the people is the alibi of tyrants throughout history. Wow. wow. I'm doing it for the people. This is wow. all for you. You may be too dumb to understand it, but this is all for you. And uh, the great thing about public health is that uh, I cannot, I'm serious here, I cannot think of a single activity of yours that I could not prohibit if you gave me carte blanche in public health. I'm not going to, I'm not going to let you, not going to let you go skin diving, not going to let you go scuba diving, not going to let you go mountain climbing, not going to let you go boating, not going to let you go swimming, because I've got to look out for public health. I don't want you to be a drain on the hospital system if something happens to you. Uh, I can control your entire life, every part of it, if you give me carte blanche on public health. And that's one of the reasons. So with that having been said, um, I believe that uh, I play a game on my own podcast, the silly serious game, where you have to divide things into being either silly or serious. Okay. Uh, raising, raising my child, that's serious. Sure. Um, but you, whether I have ice cream for dessert or not, that's silly. Um, China growing a Navy with the capability to yeah. knock out our aircraft carriers from a greater range than our airplanes on the carriers can actually handle. Mm -hmm. That's serious. Hugely serious. Um, climate change. That's silly. Uh, <laughs> um, saying things like uh, the most important mission of our military is to make it a safe place for uh, transgenders. Yes. That's silly. Yes. Make that the main function of the military. I'm not, you know, Hey, take care of everybody. I'm all for that. But to say that's the main function of the military, which I recently heard an officer say, 
that's silly. Right. And um, shutting down an economy, hurting people's lives and livelihood, that was silly. That was big time silly. Hugely silly. Yeah. Hugely silly. No, so, and, so, uh, so in a nutshell, Omicron has not, heard, and you, you know that rearranging the letters make moronic. Um, the, uh, it's, it's, it's very mild. Basically, um, I, the death figures for America have been grossly exaggerated. Uh, some places like uh, some national papers are now claiming a million people have died from COVID. Well, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're 300 million people. So that means that you should know a whole lot of people who died of COVID. That's not the case. Most of us simply do not. And the reality is that uh, we know that they've been lying. Uh, the CDC, actually, when they were still in a slightly honest mode, published a figure that about 6% of people who died of COVID didn't have comorbidities. But overwhelmingly, the, the deaths from COVID are people who were dying of old age or diabetes or heart, whatever it is. So okay. uh, bottom line is, I think we should ignore it and uh, get on with taking care of business. Yep. Yeah, Rabbi, my, my daughter, my 20-year-old daughter, a couple of days ago, she just told me she's got COVID. We uh, talked and she's fine. Uh, symptoms, she's getting over. She Obviously, she sounds sick, but she's in full, con no, no vaccine, by the way, but she's just fighting through it. Vitamin C, vitamin D, elderberry, you know, just boosting her immune That's system right. naturally. And, uh, and you should also, you know, look into, I'm sure you know about this, of course, but hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin. Uh, should be looked into, even though her doctor won't give it to her. Sure, sure. And, and uh, Dana White, the CEO of the uh, of of the MMA, of the UFC MMA mixed martial yeah. arts, instead of calling a doctor, he called Joe Rogan. Absolutely. <laughs> I, 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 I I did the same. I didn't call Joe, but I but I I, I took his his sure. that regimen and and I was fine. So anyway, that's uh, that's my view on these matters. Interesting. So now, now the the the, Jew, the Jewish people. I, lots of times, people think that the jewish people well, they own a lot of property they own a lot of businesses and you know you've mentioned our past interview that they're disproportionately the wealthiest uh, the religious group in america um but the jewish people came to the united states of america absolutely flat broke and penniless and so they came at a time where nobody was teaching english as a second language and nobody was allowing you to take care of your civic duties like take your driver's license in your old language in those days when they came here, it was English or nothing, pal. <laughs> it's it. And there was also, there was no social security. There was no welfare. There was no benefits. Uh, when they came here, nobody was handing them out money. So what were the principles? What were the mindsets? What was the values? What is it about the Jewish faith that causes this massive amount of wealth building with inside your, your, your religious community? Yeah. So uh, most of it is a series of of uh, several hundred tips and tools and specific techniques embedded within the Hebrew writings of the Old Testament. We, we touched on one when you and I were chatting before we started yeah. the show. Um, and, and so, um, and I'll, I'll just give you an example of a couple of these. Um, one of them, the one we spoke about, um, showed how in the, uh, in the, one of the one of the pilgrims, one of the, the founding fathers who came to uh, Plymouth in 1621 was William Bradford, who knew Hebrew, and uh, and he called you know he said it's the Lord's language. Well, mm -hmm. uh, in in the Lord's language, uh, we we can see in the five books of Moses that um, the uh, that Judaism regards taking care of your customer or your client or your boss uh, as the Lord's work. So we don't see religion as something we do on Sunday morning at church or Saturday morning at synagogue, uh, but we see it as something we do Monday through Friday mm -hmm. um, all the time, even when we're at our office, we're at our work, whether I'm a plumber or a roofer or a bookkeeper or whatever it is I do, yep. uh, I'm actually taking care of God's other children. Look, uh, we know from athletics, we know, we also know from uh, from um, any form of physical endeavor, the military, for instance, we know people have to be psyched up. We, you've got to believe yeah. in what you're doing. It's yeah. one of the reasons that the defender uh, has an advantage in military encounters, because you feel indignation at the invader and you feel very justified as a defender. Uh, and so it is, if you feel deep in your heart 
that making money is taking money away from other people, that every dollar you get paid is something that another person has less of, then you are going to be considerably less effective at what you do. Hmm. But one of the things that scripture teaches us, and again, you won't get this from an English translation of scripture. I'm sorry to say, I wish you could, but you can't. But uh, from the Hebrew, it becomes uh, abundantly clear that that is part of serving the Lord. So you go about your work completely differently. Right. Another right. thing is um, uh, how to connect with other people. I often hear people say to me, you know, I, I, I finished lecturing in which I said uh, that uh, the, your ability to make money is very proportional to the number of people who know you, like you, and trust you. And the person comes up to me after, it happens every time, Matt, somebody comes up to me afterwards and says, hey, Rabbi, what should I do? I'm not, I'm a real introvert. I just, I don't, I don't like meeting, I don't like talking to people. I'm, I'm just an introvert. Mm -hmm. You know, well, yeah. uh, they think that's the end of the conversation. So right. now I have to figure out a way for them how introverts are going to make money. Ain't going to happen, pal. <laughs> and But again, in, in the Hebrew scriptures, the message that comes across to the people of Israel is that being an introvert is a lot like having pimples when you're a teenager. There's you a phase, right? It's a phase. It's a phase, and you don't accept it. Right. I, I sure didn't walk around when I was 15 saying to folks, hey, um, meet me. You know, I'm Daniel Lapp and I'm just a pimply teenager. I didn't spend, do that. I mean, I spent the equivalent of a small country's gross domestic product on pharmaceuticals to clear my face up. <laughs> and so what I say to, uh, to the, the introvert is, so cut it out. Mm -hmm. you, you, you know, you're not, a, you're not a, a cow or a cat or a kangaroo. You're a human being. You don't have to be tomorrow what you were yesterday. Yesterday, you were an introvert. Yeah. Stop it. Sure. Just cut it out. Stop being an introvert. It's an unhealthy, bad state of affairs. It's not normal. It's not natural. End it. It's Stop it. Really? How do I stop being? That's a different question. If, you, if you, you know, you're you into this and you want to stop being an introvert, yeah. sure, I, I got exercises. I can take you through that. But but uh, these are the reasons we don't accept these things. Uh, we, we, we understand from the book written by the manufacturer himself what the nature of human beings are. And, and we, we learn that and, uh, and material on how to interact with people, how to develop transactions, mm -hmm. even things on how to become more articulate and how to become a more effective communicator. All of this is part of ancient Jewish wisdom. And wow. the, the people of Israel have exploited it to the full. You know, since our last conversation, I've been really diving into this ancient wisdom, even started reading uh, the Talmud and, and uh, understanding the original um, meanings of the Hebrew words I, I've been studying. Uh, a, a couple words that I, I'd love to get your take on, a couple words I've extracted, uh, because I've been wrestling with these words in the English translation, because it causes many of my family and friends and people with inside the church to say, you know what, Matt, calm down, take it easy. You know, it's easier for a camel to go to the eye of a needle than a rich man going to heaven. You know, that's what Jesus said. He was a rabbi and all these different things. And 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 people are seeing uh, uh, areas where they don't have to work, where, for example, unemployment, where people are incentivized by the government not to go back to work. And we're all frustrated because now we want to go eat out at a diner and half the staff is there and half the dining room is filled and it's caused such a ripple effect. But there is this world called Ona'a, O O N. N A apostrophe A H O N A. -A. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Um, I think so. Yes. And what, what, what? Say that again. It's basically a, mean, a, a, a definition to mean uh, to discuss oppression. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Economic oppression. Particularly. Economic oppression. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's exactly right. So, so the, and the other word, because um, I, I've been people trying to make me feel guilty that I'm ambitious. And I don't want to be content because people say, hey, Matt, God says for you just to be content. But I looked at the original context of which it was written in Hebrew, and the real world was salak. And, yeah. and, and, and from my understanding, it means to move forward. So can you, can you unpack those two? Yeah, questions? sure. So it actually doesn't say content because content is what cows are in a field on a sunny day. <laughs> Uh, people on, are not meant, to, Bring we're not meant to be content. We're, we're meant to be constantly striving and struggling. To be content is basically to be dead, meaning you're, you're just accepting the situation as it is. But we don't accept the situation. Is if, we're, if we've got pimples on our face, we cure them. If we're introverted, we cure that. 
Uh, if you break a leg, you get a plaster cast and you get that fixed up. And uh, and so it is. You, you don't accept a condition under any circumstances at all. We aim for totality. We aim for completion. And uh, just by the way, just because it may be hard to get, harder to get to heaven as a, as a rich man, everything worthwhile is hard to do. And sure. so I would want to get to heaven easily. If, if being poor is an easy way to get to heaven, I understand. What it's saying is that Poor people have very little choice. One of the reasons ancient Jewish wisdom compares poverty to death. Wow. Now, the difference is that, you know, you can come back from poverty. You can't come back from death. But uh, but the similarity is you don't have choice. Interesting. You don't have After choice. we're dead, yep. uh, our souls no yep. longer have the ability to make choices. Our the, the wonderful thing about a lifetime is all the choices you get to make. Many of them wonderful. Unfortunately, we all make mistakes. But um, uh, the, 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 the idea of seeking an easy life, that's not for godly people, not at all. And part of, be, of seeking a godly life is at embracing the challenges. And one of the challenges is, yes, of course, it's harder to get to heaven being rich. You know why? <laughs> As a rich guy, i got a lot of choices. I can do a <laughs> lot of things. <laughs> Uh, Rabbi, uh, ambition versus greed. Yeah. Ambition versus greed. Is there a difference? What yeah, a huge, a huge difference. A huge difference. Um, so, first of all, we should also um, contrast greed and and envy. And envy is, is horrible. It's the worst of everything because it means that I'm envious of you. It's not that I want to get things you got. It's, I don't want you to have them. Uh, I want to get higher than you. I want to push you down. That's what envy is all about. Horrible thing. Yeah, very horrible. There was, there was a case of a um, uh, a woman in a woman's dorm a number of years ago who threw acid on the face of the girl who won a oh, beauty yeah. contest. That's that's envy. Huge. She doesn't want to go to a beauty salon. She wants to make sure the other girl isn't beautiful. That's envy. Um, and uh, uh, greed greed the difference between greed and ambition is greed is it's all about me okay it's all about me and you know somebody comes to me and says uh i wonder if i can interest you in helping jim jim's had a little bit of a setback uh he's lost his business he wasn't well can can you we, we're trying to get together a few guys to put him back on his feet uh and greedy person says to himself i don't see how that's going to help me and he says oh you know i can't i, I don't i can't do anything i'm sorry um, an ambitious person uh, is trying to add to the sum total of the society around him. So I'm trying to get more business. I'm trying to find more customers and more clients. Uh, but my motivation is to help them. Of course, I'm going to get paid. Of course, I'm going to make a profit. But it's not out of nowhere. It's in the context of helping other people. And what's more, at least 10% of what I make is going to go to gym or other gyms around there. Right. So no, there's a world of difference, but uh, amb our ambition should be limitless. Our greed should be zero. Oh, um, one of my favorite books of the Bible is Proverbs and Ecclesiastes because it, you know, it was written by King Solomon, who's considered the richest king who's ever lived. And he took the, uh, the, the people of Israel through a golden era. I think it was a 40 year, 40 year reign. Yes, that's um, quite right. Yeah. So, so, uh, you know, as a young boy, instead of asking for riches, instead of asking for armies and territories, he asked for wisdom. So in today's day and age, how can we ask God for more wisdom? What specifics would you be asking God for, wisdom? especially in this era of lockdowns, mandates, and people resigning from their job? I mean, I had a conversation. We've been, by the way, the pandemic has been very good to us because people that resign from good professions like nurses, doctors, teachers, officers firefighters they've left their job in search of something else because their religious belief says i shouldn't be taking a vaccine so they're you know this nurse she said two years ago i was a hero because i was on the front lines because i don't want to take the vaccine this year and now i'm part of the problem so oh, it's, how should it, we be seeking wisdom yeah. matt it's an insanity you know yeah. because remember they originally told us that the vaccine will stop you getting COVID. <laughs> right okay well that's turned out to be a crock yes then they said, it'll stop you spreading it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's turned out to be a crock. Mm -hmm. you... So now they say, well, you know what vaccines about now? It makes you get a less serious um, symptoms. Symptoms. Yeah. 
Yeah. Fine. So now you're agreeing this is not public health. Now it's up to me. While you were saying I was spreading it, well, then I better take the vaccine and, and you better make me take it. But now we've established that the only thing the vaccine does is make me feel better. I choose not to. It's my choice. <laughs> right. That is the madness. And, and so when, when people are rethinking their career because they, because they can't get, a lot of my military buddies are forced out the military now. Yeah. 15 years in discharge. I'm sure, I, I'm sure many of them have come to you now to re redesign the next part of their lives. Sure. Yeah. And so if they are considering the next chapter of life, an encore career, what wisdom should they be seeking? Well, the most important uh, wisdom we get from studying the Bible in its, uh, in its real uh, inner sense, um, to be honest, I call it learning how the world really works. works. That's what I call it. And that's a little bit like my silly serious game as well. You, you've got to be able to know what counts and what doesn't, what matters and what doesn't, what's important and what isn't. Priorities. And, um, yeah. and so, uh, so, for instance, let's say somebody, uh, somebody comes to you and says, look, you know, I've, I, I want to get out of this. I want to go into another area. Uh, I'm able to get a student loan. I'm going to go back to school and I'm going to get a, a, a master's degree in gender studies. <laughs> You know, you and I, both of us would say the same thing, which is try not to be a moron. <laughs> because that's not a serious field of study. That's a silly field of study. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. You know, the... the how, how, how many of your Jewish, Jewish, uh, Jewish uh, people in the Jewish faith are going into gender studies right now? No, they're really not. They're going to become dentists and accountants and lawyers and doctors. Uh, no, because you, you don't want to waste your life on silliness. You want to do serious things. And so that would be an example. Got it. Learning how the world really works means that you realize that um, the job boards are not advertising for lots and lots and lots of people with degrees in gender studies. 100%. You're right. They're, they're advertising for a lot of people who, uh, with experience in nursing and medicine, they're advertising for people uh, with computer skills, all of that's real, but other stuff isn't. So wisdom means learning how the world really works. Uh, wisdom is learning that, uh, um, you know, having one marriage is really better than having seven marriages. And knowing how, knowing how to make it possible to be married only once all of this is learning how the world really works. This is wisdom, and uh, it's wisdom that makes for a satisfying life. You wrote a uh, you wrote a article, a written articles uh, they were interviewing here on uh, uh, I think it was CatholicEducation.org, and there was a warning. Uh, 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 I think the name of the title was was the headline: "A Rabbi's Warning to U.S. Christians." Uh, when was this written, by the way? Um, it makes me sound a little bit like a prophet. I want to tell you. Sure. Uh, it was it was written nearly twenty years ago. Holy moly! It's yeah. So relevant. I thought it was just recent, but I know. I know. It, right here, this paragraph: the war is against those who regard the Bible to be God's revelation to humanity, and the Ten Commandments to be His set of rules for all time. Phase one in this war is to make Christianity well, sort of socially unacceptable, something only foolish, poor, and ugly people could turn to. And I, I seen that's happening right now, 100% prophetic here. And is and, and this also filters out into our finances uh, because if they succeed, Christianity will be driven underground and his benign influence on the character of America will be lost. In this place, we shall see a sinister secularism that menaces Bible believers of all faiths, not just one of all faiths. Once the voice of the Bible has been silenced, the war in Western civilization can begin and we shall, set, and we shall see a long night of barbarism descend <laughs> on the West. 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. So to play uh, to play offense against this, because we see 100% this is the direction where things are headed. What can we do as citizens? What can we do as entrepreneurs? What can we do as people that are looking to make money and have money and, and contribute? What can we do? Yeah. Um, so one of, the, one of the reasons why um, the, the concept of a capital market only arose indigenously in Christian countries. Now, today you've got stock markets in Bangladesh and in Bangkok and in Beijing and everywhere. But the concept of everyone putting together money to build up capital 
that started in countries that were Christian. It started in Amsterdam in 1601. It started in London in 1611. But um, everywhere else, it only came much, much later after they saw that it worked in Western countries. Now, there's a reason for why capital worked well in Western countries, and um, it has to do with the Bible. And what I mean is this. One of the things we learn, which is a part of ancient Jewish wisdom, is that it is not possible for human beings to do business together and interact together without disagreements arising. Sure. You can be an absolute saint, and the other guy can be a saint, but there will always be misunderstandings. You know, I thought you said you're going to pay me 30 days, and, and now you're saying it's 60 days. He says, no, we said 60. Okay, you got a disagreement. Now, uh, because many people, if not most people, tend to want to avoid confrontation, in the absence of a Bible, countries just didn't engage in business. It was too risky. You ended up in arguments with people. Uh, along came God's book, and it says, look, I want you to interact with each other because the way you make money is serving each other. Now, there are going to be disagreements. Well, that's why the uh, the the one category of rules and rituals and regulations in the five books of Moses, that's more than anything else in that whole book, uh, are rules having to do with monetary disagreements. Got it. And so it says, hey, you're going to have disagreements. Terrific. Yeah. Let's get them settled. And we don't settle them with, with force. We settle them with God's word. This is how you resolve this kind of problem. Well, not surprisingly, that resulted in countries that adopted. And that's the whole idea of setting up a universal legal system where everyone understands what the rules are and things are settled by means of the, the court. That's what makes law, what makes tr uh, transactions and business possible. Sure. And it's only when, when two people find a way to do a transaction which improves both their lives, that's how money is made. Yeah. But we won't risk that if the downside is we'll never talk to each other again because we mad at each other. <laughs> and so the the biblical system made it possible for uh, for people to say, "Hey, I, I'm going to do business with you," and it's possible down the road we'll have a disagreement. Fine, we'll resolve it and we'll carry on. Just don't tell your wives about the disagreement because they keep the grudge. But you, you, that's another part of ancient Jewish wisdom, by the way. If you have a business disagreement with somebody, please don't tell your wife. She'll get so angry and resentful that this guy made you unhappy that she'll never forgive him. Meanwhile, two weeks later, you know, you and he are, are, are doing another deal. Everything's cool. You're right. Well, we get over these things. We sure. resolve them. We settle them. We get over them. We move on. But um, for women, it is a lot harder in general. There are exceptions, obviously, they are. So uh, what we need to do now, I believe, is to take care of what I call our five Fs. Here we go. Do not waste time with silly stuff. Stick with serious stuff. And here's another part of it you have to, to really lock in, Matt. I wonder how people will relate to this, but please stop trying to fix the world. Okay. Stop trying to fix the world. Do not try and make the world a better place. Please just leave it alone. Try and make your life a better place. And that's oh, the best way you can help. Yes. Me. Look at that. Because if you're busy trying to make the world a better place, you are going to use force against me to make me conform to your vision of a better world. Which is happening right now. Uh, so it's happening happen exactly right now. Karl Marx in Das Kapital actually wrote about how he'll make the world a better place when he gets everybody to be socialists. No, I, please don't make the world a better place. <clears throat> Uh, even John Lennon, late in his life, realized his song he imagined was a silly song, not a serious <laughs> song, uh, because it's a song about making the world a better place. So uh, forget that. It, it, paradoxically, it sounds as if what I'm recommending is selfish, but it isn't. Making the world a better place is selfish because you want to be the one to decide what better means. Rabbi, do you think with God's values and principles and what's written in the Bible, does God lean, in his, obviously he's not going to be labeled, but do you think his values and premises lean more towards socialistic or capitalistic type of behaviors? Um, so it's it's sort of somewhere in between. The the idea that 10% of my my money I doesn't belong to me. It's like God lets me work on a 90% commission. Correct. 10% yes. has to go 
that sounds if you're living in a laissez-faire um hardcore capitalistic economy people will say i'm not interested in that what are you talking about you can't take my money right so they'll say you're preaching socialism correct however when you live in an, under an epidemic of statism, which is what we now have in the United States of America, where the president says, you didn't build that business, the government did. Hmm. Uh, or where you've got a, uh, an elected representative saying, uh, we will tell you how much money is right for you to make. Or, or to pay yeah. your employees. Or how much, yeah, right, exactly. Under those conditions, the Bible sounds very capitalistic. So it kind of depends. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful golden mean of um of 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 building a society but in 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 a in a in an unrestrained laissez-faire capitalistic environment it sounds more socialist and vice versa so um right now it 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 would unarguably promote a very strong capitalistic agenda we're in the holiday season and uh, I, i'm just curious uh what what happens in a jewish family if i'm a child right now and I'm being raised by you, Rabbi Lappin. And, and I, you know, everybody's about gifts and buying things and, and exchanges and shopping. What's going on in a Jewish household? What is a Jewish household during doing during this time of the year? What well, does that mean? Enough, um, Hanukkah is at this roughly the same time of the year as Christmas is. And um, what we do is we give children Hanukkah, we start educating children about money. And so the gift we, we like to give children on Hanukkah is money. And uh, we also accompany that with discussions of, of what money is and what it's about and what you have to. And now you have to, you know, divide your money into three. Uh, you know, one part is for charity. One part is for you to spend on things you need. The other part is to put away and save. Um, so, yeah, Hanukkah is, uh, is the money time of the year for us. It's it's passing on to the next generation the principles of money that are so important. And, and educate me too as well. Uh, our, our guy that runs our Orlando office, he's, he's Jewish, and uh, he used to uh, host bar mitzvahs. I mean, he, used, he and his brother, bar mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs, they used to throw parties all the time. In, in the Filipino and in the Latino community, it's called quinceanera or debut when a girl comes of age or, a, 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 and then there's, I guess, there's really no ritual for a, a young man in those, in those um, uh, ethnic groups. But what happens at, what's the conversation at, at a bar mitzvah? I, I'm just, I've been part of some, but I don't, I don't know because I'm just having a good time. What's happening? How, how much money is being spent for a bar mitzvah? And is the 15, 16 year old son or daughter receiving some form of, I guess, cash capital as a gift? What is that like? Uh, Matt, I'm sorry to have to tell you. Please educate that, me. Uh, about 50 or 60%, maybe a bit more, of self described uh, American Jews um, know as much about Judaism as they know about neurosurgery. <laughs> um, and so, unfortunately, uh, for that part of American Jewry, uh, the bar mitzvah has deteriorated into a, an excuse for a wild party. Okay. And they spend a lot of money. And it's um, uh, Jews who are uh, closer, who, are, who take God's word seriously. Uh, a bar mitzvah is not a party at all. It's a time where you hand off responsibility to a young man at the age of 13. Oh. And you tell him that uh, up till now, you've been a kid from now on, you have to uh, fulfill God's wishes. You could ignore them and play when you were a kid. Now you can't. And so there's no, no money needs to be spent at all. It's not, it's not party time. It's serious time. Wow. It's, it's more like, um, you know, many cultures, if I'm not mistaken, I, I think maybe some uh, American Indian cultures used to have a ritual to, uh, to help young men become sure. braves coming of age yeah right right correct and now we don't do that for girls you know why because little girls automatically become young ladies by nature taking yeah they, they just do yeah but little boys if you don't do something to give them a kick in the pants spiritually speaking of course they um uh, they will become 40-year-old adolescents. Wow. 
Um, little boys will stay little boys for as long as they possibly can. Yeah, without without being forced to grow up. I, I yeah, was, and was, so the bar mitzvah yeah. is a spiritual kick in the pants. It's you know what, we've given you a free ride up till here. Now you're now you're one of the guys you have to carry the load. Wow, that's that's but that's an interesting tradition to have in our family to have to incorporate. Okay, I'm gonna have to go back to all my kids. All right, 26 year old, 20. Okay, come back, come back, come back. Yeah, we're gonna incorporate something, and so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the, the, uh, we've got a rapper here in America called Jay Z. Okay, yes. and he took heat for his comments in his song "Story of OJ." Uh, on his comments on Jewish people in his song uh, "Story of OJ," and, and the lyrics go like this: "You want to know what's more important than throwing away money at a strip club? Credit. You ever wonder why Jewish people own all the property in America? This is how they did it." Okay, and so a lot of people thought that was anti-Semitic term, but he's actually giving a shout out. To I like it. I, I'm not community. bothered by it at all. Okay, so so uh, your friends. I wish, with... it was, I wish it was true. <laughs> Correct. Oh, okay, so so you're, you're obviously you're, you're friends with uh, Dave Ramsey, and and he's he's very anti credit card, anti credit anything. Yes, yes. But how is the Jewish people leverage that with being money lenders? Yeah. And, and, um, and yeah, right. It's an important question, and uh, look, I'm a huge fan of of Dave Ramsey. He has brought financial peace to to more Americans than anybody else. And I mean, I think you may be creeping up on his Come numbers. Come on, baby, let's go seven figure squad. Yes, sir. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, and th the problem is that uh, for many of us, um, debt is becomes an addiction. And the problem is that once, you know, once you owe, you know, a few thousand dollars, it never seems like a big deal to add another few hundred dollars. And that's why debt tends to spiral out of control. And Dave Ramsey has developed a system for helping you and me, ordinary America, ordinary people everywhere around the world, uh, to break that pattern and to get out of debt. And it's an absolute lifesaver. Um, having done that, once you're out of debt, and you're able to, um, uh, to enjoy the freedom that being debt-free imparts, to then say, okay, um, you know, my business is running at this, at this level, this is what I've got, uh, I'm going to borrow a, a quarter of a million dollars to stock up and boost my inventory for the holiday season, because I know I'm going to run, uh, run out of product, and, and so I'm now going to go into debt you know, to the tune of 250 grand, um, which I should be in a position to pay back by uh, the end of January. It, it would be silly not to, as long as you're not in a fragile situation. So is that if something goes wrong, and let's say the customers don't materialize for some reason, you're not ruined. Right. Then right. You, if, if you're running that close to the wind and you, you mustn't, you're not ready for debt yet. And the debt must never be consumer debt. It must never be, um, you know, gee, I really want to buy Christmas presents for everybody, so I'm going to borrow. No, no, not for that. But to go into debt to buy a piece of real estate, God bless you, go for it. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, be wise. Money is made in real estate on the buying end, not the selling end. If you buy stupidly, you'll never make money on the selling end. What a profound perspective. Yeah, by the way, a lot of people argue it's the other way. Interesting that you said that because you're investing for cash, you're for cash flow. I get it, um, Rabbi. We only have a few minutes here, um, and, and by the way, I just enjoy this conversation. Every time I talk to you, a, a, an hour long conversation feels like five minutes. Uh, uh, by the way, it's interesting to see that you're on the East Coast by water again. So I'm pretty sure you're. Are you back to boating again? And uh, no, I'll t we we only you know you know. People, people are strange, and I'm stranger than most. I mean, uh, we only boat in the waters of British Columbia in oh, Canada. Wow. Um, so although I'm, I'm really close to the Atlantic, uh, I don't believe I've ever boated on the Atlantic. Well, I have on the other side. I've boated on the English, English side of the Atlantic, but not on the Western Atlantic. Gotcha. All right. Um, we want to encourage people. This is part of our Vlogmas series because we're putting an episode every day for 24 days all the way until the 25th until Christmas. And and what would your encouragement, what would your advice be if I want to make sure this is the beginning 
of the greatest years of my financial life going into 2022, getting past this pandemic and past these things that yes. economically yeah. hurt a lot of people. What would your guidance be going to the next year? Um, well, I think uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say that people should um, get hold of my book, Thou Shall Prosper. Of course. Um, yeah. Obviously, people should uh, connect with somebody like you as a specific guide. But in, in more general terms, I'd say, number one, if you haven't yet learned how to read financial statements, use the rest of this year to take an online course or buy, borrow books from the library, whatever you want. It's just not that hard to do. But the bottom line is you cannot change anything you cannot measure. You cannot change anything you cannot measure. If you want to lose weight, for example, and you don't have a scale, it's not going to happen. Right. You've got to be able right. to. So, uh, although you might say to yourself, and you know, I haven't got that much money right now. I, I really don't need a profit and loss report. I really don't need cash flow state. Yes, you do. Because you now need to set up the system that will operate when you are have reached the point you want to reach. Okay. So uh, please learn to uh, learn to work fluently with financial statements. Uh, number two, spend less time in front of a screen with entertainment and more time with books. You don't say you have the whole library behind you. I agree. Don't yeah. corrupt your brain with nonsense. Yeah, yeah but th it. this this is just a virtual background, you know. This is just yeah. a uh, <laughs> screen, but it's a very sophisticated one because it lets me do things like this, you know. Hey, not bad. It's like three. You have the three D back screen. <laughs> it's a very sophisticated virtual screen. Yes, that's right. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so uh, there's several reasons for that. Reading books improves your ability to communicate. Watching television or YouTube does not. Uh, secondly, uh, it develops your cognitive ability. You 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 are smarter when you read than when you watch. Watch is a passive activity which reduces your ambition and it reduces your testosterone. It's just bad. So use make a resolution to use a certain number of hours take away from screen time and add it to book time. And I, I, I've uh, never and then heard lost. of the difference there. I've never heard oh, somebody break down the difference between watching and reading. Huge, huge difference, Matt. Huge. Yeah. Um, guys' testosterone goes down and their estrogen goes up the more time they sit on a couch watching the screen. Boom. There it is. Hello, everybody. Hey, guys. Put down the cheeseburger, pick up a book, and pick up some dumbbells. <laughs> yeah. That way you, you make sure you don't become a dumbbell. It's, oh. <laughs> And so I, uh, you, you were talking about a, a, a course you were teaching online. Is there any way we can ac get access to that course? Yeah, RabbiDanielLappin.com. Gotcha. RabbiDanielLappin.com. And um, yeah, absolutely. There are also uh, courses there. Having said, spend less screen time. There's also a video course on prosperity. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, no, look, I mean, to, to, to wholeheartedly embrace ambition, and say to yourself, by this time next year, and be reasonable. You know, don't say by this time next year, you know, I want to own a 200-foot yacht and, uh, sure. and uh, you know, be reasonable. Uh, by this time next year, you know, I, I want to be generating three times my average income now is what I want to be generating next, uh, next year this time. I want to 3x my income. That's reasonable if you do the right. Wouldn't you agree, Matt? I mean, if somebody listens to you and really does what he ought to do. Sure. In in 12 months to 3x your income, I think so. Yeah, I, I went from a, a $20,000 a year salary in the United States Marines to three years later, earning my first six figures in income, getting involved in the insurance business because I had to go through so much profound personal yeah. development and i'm still going through this very profound spiritual development yeah and, and just to have the skills necessary to grow as an individual i mean yeah. it, it takes a minute and uh i think sadly social media today and in a lot of people today when you talk about we're inherently lazy a lot of people say you just want to make money just by sitting behind a computer screen cl uh, click a couple buttons uh, turn a picture into an nft and we want to be an instant overnight millionaire well That's there, right. there's, pro there's a process to that the process to That's that sounds right. great but, uh, but, but in short, uh, devote most hours of your life to serious matters, not silly matters. 
Gotcha. And now for those of you watching this, I hope you take your financial lives seriously. Uh, this is part two of the conversation here with Rabbi Lappin, and, and, and this is becoming uh, a, a thing where people are asking more about this information that he's talking about. So make sure you check out Rabbi Lappin's website. It was rabbilappin.com. Uh, Rabbi Daniel Lappin.com. There you go, rabbidaniellappin.com. And uh, make sure you pick up his book, Thou Shall Prosper, Ten Commandments of Money, which we mentioned earlier, uh, the gentleman's name, forward by Dave Ramsey, uh, is in that book too as well. And uh, for those of you, what are your thoughts? What are your comments? What's your feedback? What are things that you agree with, you don't agree with? We want to know, put it in the comment section below. And make sure you follow Rabbi Daniel Lappin on YouTube, as well as his Instagram page too as well so uh, rabbi an honor and pleasure to have this conversation Matt, thank you very much for having me back it's an honor for me to chat with you i really admire everything you've accomplished not only for yourself but all the people around you and i hope your little lamborghini driver is doing well <laughs> <laughs> you remember that one as jordan yeah he's uh, he's two and a half years old now guys how old is he now he's yeah he's two and a half he's okay great right yeah, well cool. thanks for having me back and and thank ivan for making it all come together you got it, 100%. Everybody, if you're watching this on Facebook, make sure you click like. Follow our business page, Money Smart Guy. And if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click like, subscribe, hit notifications to be alerted the next time we upload our next episode. And on behalf of Rabbi Daniel Lapp, and I'm your Money Smart Guy. And until we meet again, until, until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today. God bless you guys. Bye-bye.